Hi guys, in this video we will be learning about glacial systems and processes. We will be learning about how glaciers act as natural systems, glacial budgets and finishing with an exam style question. As we learnt in the first video, a system is an assemblage of interrelated parts that work together by ways of some driving processes. In this video we're going to look at glacial systems to understand how when and where glaciers and ice sheets form and their effects on the landscape. This diagram is showing the open system of an ice sheet. And to recover what we know before, systems that are open include inputs, as shown here, stores, which is the mass of ice, processes, shown here as plucking, abrasion, ablation, accumulation and transportation, these are issues that we will cover later on, as well as outputs shown here as melt, water and moraine. Snow and ice are our inputs in our glacial system and these can reach the system through snowfall or avalanches. These inputs can also be known as accumulation as noted here and this is an important word that we're going to look at in more detail. At the other end of our system we have our outputs shown here as meltwater and moraine and these can be also named as ablation as shown here. So to simplify things we can think of accumulation as our inputs and ablation as our outputs and through this system our inputs are transferred down the valley under the influence of gravity, which is pulling it down the slope. And when they reach the end of the glacier, also known as the snout of the glacier, they become our outputs. So the inputs is the mass gained by the glacier and our outputs, also known as ablation, is the mass that is lost. Now that we've covered what is meant by accumulation and ablation, we are going to look at glacial budgets because the glacial budget is dependent on the balance between inputs and outputs. So the glacial budget can be defined as the balance between inputs and outputs. And this is dependent on the mass lost and mass gained by the glacier. So, for example, to have a positive budget, this happens during glacial periods where we have increased amounts of snow, also known more generally as precipitation, and less melt. So, overall, the mass of the glacier increases. So that is a positive budget, but on the other hand, a negative budget is where we have more mass lost than mass gained. So we have less snow as our input and more melt. And therefore, the sides of the glacier will shrink so here the size of the glacier is increasing and with a negative budget it is decreasing and this is when the glacier will retreat and over here this is where our glacier will advance. The lowest edge of a glacier is called the snow line and this can be influenced by a number of factors. For example we are going to look at how the aspect of a slope which is another word for the gradient and position of a slope influences the snow line. So this diagram shows a glacier in the northern hemisphere. So as we can see in this diagram, the sun is hitting the slope on its southern side and so the south side is receiving more insulation than the northern side over here which is receiving less insulation otherwise known as solar radiation. So with higher levels of insulation on the southern side, 
the snow line is going to be higher up because there'll be increased melting. Whereas on the northern side, we are receiving less insulation from the sun. So we have more permanent snow cover and a lower snow line. So referring back to the glacial budget above, this side would have a negative glacial budget and this side have a positive glacial budget where it's easier for the snow to be advancing. And on this side, it's more likely that the snow line is retreating. Now I'm going to give you a brief introduction to the different types of snow. And we need to know about this because this is important to understanding accumulation and ablation, which are the concepts that we learned about earlier in the video. As we learned before, the input into most glacial systems is snow. So that's why I'm going to teach you here how initial snowfall can eventually form a glacier. So the first type of snow that initially falls has flakes with a very open structure. So it's given the French term called neve, and this refers to layers of freshly accumulated snow. So we'll just label this as fresh snow. So the important thing to remember about neve, which is the fresh snow, is that it has lots of air pockets. Now, as this fresh snow accumulates, obviously the lower layers are going to become compressed by the other layers. So here the arrows are showing the pressure going downwards. So then we have a layer forming which is called fern. And this is a more compact layer of snow. So as you can see, these snow particles are more closely packed together. Following this, with the layer of neve and fern, the snow is going to compact even more. So we've got even more pressure going downwards. And along top of this, we have melt water that is going to seep in between the gaps in the snow particles. And this will eventually freeze and become solid ice. As these layers become even more compact, the air is expelled out and that's why the colour changes from white to almost a pale blue colour as shown here. But the important thing to remember is that this is not a fast process and occurs over about 20 to 40 years. Eventually, if this mass of ice here becomes large enough, it will develop into a glacier. Now we're going to look at the concepts of ablation and accumulation in more detail because these are responsible for the growth and retreat of glaciers. To recap what we said earlier in the video, ablation is what is lost from the glacier and accumulation is what is gained. So if we look at this diagram here, we have our zone of accumulation. So this is where our snowfall is going to occur and that's our input into the system. And this is our zone of ablation where our melting takes place. So in our zone of accumulation, inputs are greater than outputs. So mass is gained. Whereas in our zone of ablation, outputs are greater than the inputs, so mass is lost. As we can also see on the diagram, there is this line here, which is called the equilibrium line. And this is simply the boundary between the zones of ablation, shown here, and accumulation. So this is the area where net loss is equal to net gain and that is our equilibrium line. Now that we've learned a bit about accumulation and ablation and the glacial budget we're going to look at the patterns of ice advance and retreat and in this example in particular we are looking at a glacier in the northern hemisphere. Referring back to the glacial budget that we just learned about this is a good equation to summarise it. So our glacial budget 
also known as our net balance, can be referred to as the total accumulation minus the total ablation. So if the net balance is a positive number, the glacier is in advance. And if it is negative, which means that total ablation is greater than total accumulation, our glacier is in retreat. And this graph here explains why this happens. So for a glacier in the northern hemisphere, where we have our winter months as January, February, December, and our summer months as May, June and July and August, this blue line represents accumulation of the glacier. So as we can see in the winter months, this is when snowfall is happening. So we have an increase in the amount of water and ice going into the glacier. But as we move into the summer months, this decreases and we move back into the winter and it increases. So on the other hand, this dotted line is showing ablation. So we have less ablation, which is more melting happening. So we have less ablation in happening in the winter. And as we move into the summer, the melting is increasing as temperatures rise. And then this drops again as we move into the winter. So during the winter, which is shown here in these green areas, our glaciers are advancing. And in the summer months, our glaciers are retreating because there is a negative balance. And if in total for the year, the positive balance of advance is equal to the negative balance and the amount of retreat, our glacier is said to be stationary, which means that for the entire year, the glacier hasn't changed its budget. However, to show you the opposite, say this line of ablation was much steeper and up here, and there was a greater negative balance than positive balance, this would mean our glacier was retreating. And on the other hand, if we had a greater increase in snow and less retreat in the summer, this would mean that our glacier is overall going to be advancing. Glaciers can be classified as either warm based or cold based and this links back to the glacial budget which relates to the balance between inputs and outputs into a glacial system. Firstly, to give an overview of warm based glaciers. These are found in more maritime locations which simply means coastal. And an example of a maritime warm-based glacier is that of the Franz Josef Glacier in New Zealand, which we can see in this photo here. Warm-based glaciers tend to be much smaller valley glaciers than cold-based glaciers, ranging from hundreds of metres to a few kilometres in width, and hundreds to tens of kilometers, so 10,000 meters in length. Meanwhile, cold base glaciers have very different characteristics. They are almost all found in high latitude areas, which are the Arctic and Antarctic regions. And as we remember, these are at the North and South Poles. And they commonly refer to much larger glaciers associated with ice caps and ice sheets, which are very large masses of ice. An example of a cold-based glacier is the Commonwealth Glacier in Antarctica, and this is a photo of it here. And as we can see, comparing this cold-based glacier to the warm-based glacier up here, we can tell that they are very different and we are going to go into their characteristics why they look different in the next part of the video. The reason why warm-based and cold-based glaciers look very different is due to the different climates of where they're located, which means they have very different glacial budgets. As you remember, the glacial budget is the balance between inputs into the system and outputs. 
Warm base glaciers tend to be found in areas with a high winter snowfall as well as a high summer temperature and this helps to create high melt rates. These high amounts of meltwater, as we can see in this photo here, you can see a massive meltwater stream coming off the glacier. This helps to act as a lubricant for the glacier and allows the glacier to be more mobile. So they move a lot more than cold based glaciers, as they noted, fast movement. This is also linked to the low melting point of the glacier. And this means that all the ice contained in the glacier is at a temperature which is near to its melting point. So this means that with seasonal variations, we get a lot of meltwater. Another characteristic is that warm base glaciers have a surface layer, which is very thin, and this is made up of more recent snow. So we can just label this as fresh snow. And this helps to insulate the layers of ice beneath it. Moving on to cold base glaciers now. We can instantly see that they have a very different glacial budget because they have low precipitation, which means less snowfall, but also a low melt rate. So this is complete contrast from the warm base glacier that we just saw. This means that accumulation and ablation rates are both very low, which results in slow movement of the glacier. So we're just right here, low ablation, which we learned before was melting and accumulation, which was a gain in mass of the glacier, such as snowfall. This means that the ice that we see here on this glacier is very old and has been there for thousands and thousands of years because there's little melting and there's little snow added to it. So it pretty much stays like this for a long time. However, ice can be lost in a different method, which is the carving of icebergs. And this is where under pressure, big blocks of ice just separate from the main body of the glacier. And finally, we're going to look at an exam style question, which is explain what is meant by the glacial budget. And this is a three mark question. So for this question, we need to remember that the glacial budget is the balance between the incomes and the outputs to the glacier, which can cause the glacier to either grow or retreat. So I've started off here by giving an overview of what the glacial budget is saying the glacial budget refers to the inputs to a glacial system, such as snow. So you can see I've given examples. And the outputs from the system, such as melting ice. Again, I've given a good demonstration of what an input and an output is. And I've also gone on to state how the glacial budget can be looked at through different timescales. So I put this may be seen in terms of zones of the glacier or timescales such as seasons. This is because, as we saw in my diagrams in the earlier video, we had a diagram which showed the zones of ablation and accumulation. So there's a glacial budget between those two areas. So I've mentioned these zones, but we can also look at the glacial budget over the course of a year and how it changes due to temperature changes. Then I have finally referred to what the glacial budget actually measures. So I've said, it relates to the overall balance between inputs and outputs. And then I've gone on to give an explanation as to what happens to the glacier in this section, depending on the different budgets. So I've said, if there are more inputs than outputs, the mass of the glacier will increase. And if the outputs are greater than the inputs, the mass will decrease. This shows here that you can understand the impact of a changing glacial budget. Hi guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you're looking for an amazing A-level geography resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. See you soon and together let's make A-level geography a walk in the park.